Oh, well, you know what? Right. Oh, there we go. Um, right, so I, I think I think we're on, Karen. I think we are, yeah. Yeah, so we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes just to get themselves seated, get themselves a nice cup of coffee or cola, whatever their beverage is. So my name's Robert Falconer Taylor, and I have to give huge thanks to Andrew Hale, Andy, who's the inspiration and the energy behind the Dog Centered Care Group. To be honest, I think he's very brave to cut me loose here on my own um, on what is really an experiment and a chance for me to catch up with friends and colleagues all over the world and see what they're up to in their professional lives in the dog world and of course, other animal worlds too. Now, for my first inaugural um, meeting here, I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to welcome Karen Pienaar. Um, now, she's been working professionally in as a companion animal behaviorist for over, 20 feet, for over 20 feet, 25 years now. Um, she's commander in chief of COPE International. She also heads up um, wildlife enrichment programs at a number of, of, of zoos and other kind of institutions where there are wildlife. Uh, and that's really important for vet care, rehabil rehabilitation, rescue, and so on and so forth. And most importantly, and why we're here tonight, is because she's written a book. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So really, over to you, Karen. What was your inspiration to sit yourself down for four long years and write this book? Um, well, Rob, to be very honest with you, I think a touch of insanity. Uh, it, that really kind of in hindsight sums it up for me because no sane person does all the stuff that I've been doing and then decide okay well you know let's put it down in a book but realistically speaking um, the concept of Mira was born through the work that we did at one of the captive wildlife facilities that we were right. working with yeah. um, where the importance of taking animal emotionality into consideration in getting compliance and consent from the animals that we worked with, it became so pronounced. And the more people that I spoke to about that, the more people said, oh, you should write a book. You really need to put all this stuff down on paper. And uh, when enough people say that to you, eventually you start thinking, hey, maybe that's a good idea. Let's do that. And then... Um, yeah, four years later, and, and here I am, having finally finished it, and, and here it's done. Off to the publishers today, actually. Oh, brilliant. So who, who are you publishing with? It's going to be published through Dogwise. Wow. Which I'm thrilled about. I am that so happy. That is brilliant. Wow, well done you. That is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm so pleased to be working with them, and I really am looking forward to the next step of getting all of this stuff out onto real paper. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I think really where we should start, obviously it's about emotional states and mood states and affective states and so on and so forth. Perhaps you can just give us a broad outline of what, what MIRA actually is and how your work with the zoo animals brought you to developing the system. Um, you know, originally, of course, as a, as, as a companion animal behaviorist, um, how it brought you to this and how it brought you to coming up with the MIRA concept. We were contacted uh, to come and help at one of the local zoos here in South Africa yeah. who wanted some assistance in uh, teaching the animals to participate in uh, consent-based husbandry procedures for welfare, obviously. Yeah. Uh, having worked with, actually, let me backtrack a little bit. The precursor to Mira was Emra, and Emra was developed by uh, some brilliant people about 25 years ago. Uh, that focused on the emotion, taking the emotionality of animals into perspective when evaluating the treatment of behavior problems in mm -hmm. companion animals. And so having worked with EMRA, which stands for uh, basically emotional assessment, mood state assessment, reinforcement analysis, having worked with EMRA for so long, it, it's second, second nature to start applying this onto every different animal that you work with. And then when we started working with the zoo and we started um, evaluating all of these animals that we were expected to work with everything from elephants all the way through to western a western lowland gorilla to chimpanzees uh, lions tigers fish uh, a couple of reptiles um, all of these different species of animals uh, we decided okay well let's start looking at this from an emotionality perspective 
because we've, you know, all the stuff that we know about Panksepp and the brain and how all these different systems work together in the mammalian brain, we thought, okay, well, that's maybe a good starting point to look at this. But the more we applied EMRA, the more it became clear that the order of things were a little bit shuffled upside down. Mm-hmm. The, I think probably for me, one of the most important moments working with um, the gorilla, for example, you know, you can't make an animal that size do anything he doesn't want to. And if he doesn't feel like participating in that particular moment, then you can stand on your head and, and dangle as many dates in front of him as you want to, and he's not going to do anything. And the more time I spent with him, the more, uh, the clearer it became to me that addressing the animal's mood state must be the starting point. Determining how they're feeling over and above the moments where they're having emotional fluctuations, that is the point where really everything should start with. When we look at um, MIRA, you know, MIRA stands for, it's the acronym that's just changed a little bit around, where we now look at mood state first, and part of mood state, we evaluate the hedonic budgets of the animals, we look at uh, what their lives look like from a, almost an ethogram perspective, and then we do the emotionality assessment and the reinforcement analysis. And the reason why putting mood state first is so important is because your mood influences how you feel, how you behave, what you do. It influences the decisions that you make, the choices that you decide on. Every single little thing that you do every day, every single emotional experience is filtered through your mood. And your mood state affects the decisions, like I said, and how you choose to respond to certain stimuli. If you are in a bad mood and your bad mood lasts for months or weeks or years, because your environment isn't meeting your needs or there's something that's bothering you. Um, How you feel is going to have an enormous impact on how you react to stimuli and how you're going to react to things that are happening to you. And so that kind of got me thinking about how with Emra it was the other way around and we were first looking at the emotionality of the animal and how the animal is feeling while performing the behavior problem. And while that certainly has merit, the the starting point to this really should be looking at how are you feeling underneath these little emotional fluctuations because how you're feeling underneath your cognitive bias your approach your view on things those are the things that are going to determine how you respond and from that mirror was born and then we tried it and well we developed i developed the concept and we we tested it on a lot of things um a whole different bunch of animals And the response was incredible. I mean, honestly, once we started looking at it from a a slightly different perspective, um, the the reaction from the animals and the receptivity to the behavior modification protocols that we put in place, it was just just mind blowing. It was unbelievable how those animals started to respond and watching how they worked through these adjustments to the their daily life and how their moods changed and how that facilitated their cooperation with us. Uh, it was honestly one of the most incredible moments that I think I will never forget. Yeah. Now, what you're actually talking about here are two very different things, which are um, happiness and pleasure. Now, most people think those are the same thing. But of course, if you look back 2000 odd years, Aristotle defined eudaimonia as the general daily happiness that you have in your life. So it's, it's what you're calling mood state here. Whereas pleasure, something different. Pleasure is a kind of up and down of yeah. an emotional state. And I think this is what you're describing here. So what you're actually saying is that um, there's no point tempting a gorilla with some dates because, he, because he's going to get some pleasure from having a date. Um, you're not going to achieve that unless you've actually addressed his overall happiness scale which is his, his eudaimonia, which is a quite separate thing, which is what you're working with, with the mood state. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. you know, the thing um, also that we, when we started, when I started to apply this to companion animals, um, one of the biggest, uh, I don't want to use the word side effect, but it's probably a good word for this, mm. was that we, it became evident that um, addressing mood state 
and determining where an animal is in terms of his mood state overall, that actually influences the speed at which the behaviorist can apply things with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we always, I remember that, you know, it always used to be a case if you go in and you do your evaluations and you go, all right, fine, this is what the problem is. This is what I think is the the individual approach that this dog needs or this cat needs. So Let's you're, talking, apply. you're talking about emotional state here with the old EMRA system. Yes. Yeah, where um, just to be clear, so everyone knows we're on the same page, this is where we went in and we assessed an animal through questioning with the owner and also what we saw in front of us, whether the animal was cowering in a corner or happy to see us. So that was, that was where our assessment was based. What you're saying is that with this mood state, with the M of Myra, you're taking a much broader view. This is, this is, this is going back to Aristotle's Udemy. Yeah, the, absolutely, because with Mira, an animal's cognitive bias, how he perceives what's going on around him, how he perceives his environment, that, you know, if you're looking at an animal with, for example, a pessimistic bias, where he views anything new coming into his environment as potentially a danger or not predicting anything good, those are things that really should be taken into consideration as a critical part of the behaviorist's approach. Because if you have an animal that cannot perceive anything new being brought into his environment as anything other than a threat or something that is going to be predicting unpleasant things for him, um, that animal, it doesn't matter if you are trying to uh, increase the amount of feel-good activities in his, in his household. If you're trying to balance his hedonic budget by increasing, for example, seeking system activation or play system activation, and you are doing it by introducing uh, food dispensing toys, if this dog or cat works very well with cats as well, if this animal is looking at anything new coming into the environment and going, <gasps> that is not going to be anything good for me the result in real life is that the owner looks at this and goes well the stuff that i'm supposed to be putting into place here isn't working because my dog is not playing with them or he's not showing interest in it or he's not responding to the work that the behaviorist is trying to put in place and then that comes across as the the behavior modification program is flawed when what's actually happening is the speed with which it's being applied is too fast for the animal to cope with because that animal's mood doesn't allow him to be open to changes. And if you are in a, a, a short answer here, if you are in, in core affect space and you are dealing with an animal who is from a, who's in a Q3 quarter, Q3 is basically, when we look at the core affect space graph, it's measured along the axes of um, arousal and valence. Yep. And then we've divided it into four, four quadrants. And now the first quadrant is where we're looking at high valence, so positively valenced, high arousal yeah. emotions. So po positive valence, high arousal is basically really good things. Negative really valence, good. high arousal is really bad things. Yes. And valence exactly. is a measure. It's a quantity of goodness or badness. Absolutely. Yeah. And so when we're looking at Q1, we are looking at emotions like pleasure and delight and um, ex ecstasy. So Q1 and, is where? The top, top, top left? Uh, <laughs> You've got four, four quadrants, <laughs> valence, arousal. So one, two, three, four, like yeah. this. Okay, so if it's on a thingy like this. Um, you've got Q1 at the top here, where you've got your very intense positive emotions, that's high arousal. And then underneath that, you've got Q2, which is your low arousal, positively valenced emotions. So here are where we're experiencing things like calm, um, relaxed, uh, feeling content, all your, your, your calm, feel good emotional states. Then we've got Q3, which is low arousal negative valence. And there we're looking at feelings like uh, discontentment, uh, misery, depression, uh, yeah, despair. And then Q4 is, is the one where we really want to stay away because that's where all your highly arousing negatively valenced emotions happen. So those are things where you've got terror and fear and anxiety and frustration and anger and rage. Um, and so what, if you have an animal who is living in, for example, Q3, which is low arousal negative valence, that animal isn't capable of responding to novel stimuli in a positive way. 
And if that is the mood state that he's living in, it means that his receptivity to change is going to be almost zero. Yeah. And of course, and many, that, many of these animals are the ones that are going to be living kind of on the borders. Yes. And so yeah. um, when the behaviorist goes in, we see an animal that's excited by seeing somebody new. But of course, the background of that is the animal's mood state is actually pretty poor on average. And so as soon as the behaviorist goes away, the dog then flops back into the old behavior. And I think yeah. what you're saying is it's important to identify the quadrant, regardless of where it is in that quadrant because any kind of behavior management um, uh, system you're gonna put in is gonna be compromised by the animal's overall mood state that might not be detectable. You know, it's not obvious because the dog is not kind of in terror at the time that you go in and in terror all the time. And maybe even the owner doesn't notice sometimes, but yet the dog is, is showing some other ab aberrant kind of behavior, which is a reflection of this ongoing poor mood state. And, you know, for a very long time, um, the, when you balance the hedonic budget, it's all about making sure that the animal gets what he needs according yes. to his type, according to what is supposed to happen for him in his day-to-day -day life. Yeah, so what, and, what, what, what de describe a hedonic budget? What, okay. what, what, what do you see that as? I'm, I, I, I'm the owner. Okay. How, how does that work? The, the animal's hedonic budget is basically where we look at things that this particular individual needs in order to make him a behaviorally and emotionally healthy and balanced individual. Yeah. So we look at certain things like, for example, does your dog have sufficient opportunity to engage in play? And does he like playing with other dogs? Does he like playing with the cat in your household? Does he like playing with you? A lot of the hedonic budget categories that we've got, and I'll go into that in a second, mm -hmm. um, is based on a lot of PANCSEP systems. So we have the positive systems uh, where we're looking at play, care, and uh, seeking, where we want to have those systems activating or um, more present in the dog's day-to-day -day life as we go along. So we want to make sure that if you have a dog who uh, is designed, bred, to spend a large portion of his day herding sheep, but now he's a couch potato, uh, if his inherent needs aren't being met, he might actually not feel so happy about his day-to-day -day life. So what we do is we look at, all right, fine, how much time are you supposed to spend engaged in this activity? And if you are spending uh, five minutes on, a, on, a, on an activity that you should be spending half an hour on, then there's an imbalance on your hedonic budget. So how can we improve the amount of time that you, or increase the amount of time that you're spending doing something that makes you happy yeah for a lack of a better word yeah and to be absolutely clear what you're describing here are tools that are actually used with the owners so the whole yes. point of this is you have sets of paperwork and tools and it's quite prescriptive because what it does is make sure that the behaviorist working with the dog at any level um, of experience has all the tools they need to ask all the right questions and make all the right assessments and so it's kind of standardized way of doing things. That's that's exactly what Mira is. Mira is yes. a toolkit. It's an yep. assessment tool yep. that works both on the level of what the owner needs to understand to um, influence and adjust and change how they're treating their dog or mm -hmm. their cat. Uh, but on the other hand, it is also an assessment tool for the behaviorist to go, all right, fine. This animal is not in the kind of mood at the moment where we can proceed at a rapid pace with behavior modification. Yeah. We have to work slowly. We have to let the dog set the pace. Um, to give you an example, one of the cases that I talk about in the book is um, a household with two different dogs in it. And the one dog comes from a very poor background uh, where he was kept in really not, not pleasant conditions. And that's contrasted to the other one who was kept in environments that supported his needs and his wants and all those kinds of things. And we look at how um, the one dog's mood compares to the other dog's mood and how that affected his receptivity to behavior modification, how he took much longer to adjust to 
anything that happened in his household, uh, how it took him longer to bond to his new guardians, how it took him a long time to interact with the other dog, how it took him forever to start understanding how to use toys. And the reason why I chose that particular case is because it really emphasized the importance of using mirror in that order to start with, let's look at your mood. Let's look at your hedonic budget. Your mood is going to tell us exactly how fast we can proceed with fixing or adjusting or balancing your hedonic budget. Once we've got those things in place, then we can start looking at your emotional experiences that you are having on a day to day basis. So these fluctuations, how do you deal with them? What are your strategies to help you cope? And all those strategies, what we want you to do, or do we want you to do something else? And then how do we teach this to you? And that's, that's kind of for me, and I might, be slight, I might be slightly biased here, but for me, that's one of the nice things about Mirror is that, mm -hmm. yes, it's an assessment protocol that helps the practitioner to determine the speed at which behavior modification needs to happen. It is also a tool that um, once you've done the hedonic budget assessment, it gives you a starting point. So if you are, you know, if you're new to the industry, for example, one of the big things that we often see with our students is they'll, they'll say, okay, but where do I start? I've now, I've determined what the problem is, but what do I begin with to actually help this dog or help this cat? And that's what Mira is very useful for as well, because once you've identified those discrepancies in the hedonic budget and you've worked out the speed at which you can change things with, the next thing is, okay, not enough of this, here's how we're going to change this. Yeah. And you start by adjusting the things that are going to have an overall impact on the animal's mood. Okay. So basically right. Mira gives you the roadmap. Yes. But it's you that then that you then need to choose the route. It also gives you an idea of the route you need to take, depending on and the individual the dogs and also the, the owner's capabilities, the behaviorist capabilities, of course. Yes. Um, and um, managing the owner's expectations, which I think is a huge concern in, in the behavior industry. We always have owners who want things now, now, now. And I think rather than the behaviorist just turning around and saying, well, no, it's going to take six months. If you can explain to the owner with these charts and maps and all this kind of thing, why their particular dog is, is in the place they're in, it makes the owners much more sympathetic. And it may actually, you, 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 can, you, you can use mirror, as a mirror on the, on the owner as well. Absolutely. and make them assess their own mood states and their own frustrations and worries at work and this kind of thing and worried about the teenagers bring all of that into the equation so it truly is a kind of holistic approach to managing behavior problems mira can also be used by the practitioner like you said on the human mm -hmm. um because you know if you are looking at uh, actually and here COVID has been quite useful from a, a an academic observational perspective, let me put it like that. <laughs> um, if you look at the impact that uh, lockdown and the threat of the end of the world and all those kinds yeah. of things have had on the mood state of humans, uh, Mira is incredibly useful for the behaviorist as well to use on the guardians because if the human is incapable of implementing what you suggest as a behaviorist because they're stressed they're tired their mood state is very poor um, they're having emotional reactions to things all the time that's going to affect the success of the behavior modification program as well and that's going to have a huge impact on the animal's life so mirror can be used side by side and i do this with my clients all the time where i'll go all right this is what's happening with your dog let's have a look at what's happening with you and let's compare it because honestly, I find that that it generates a certain amount of understanding and sympathy in people when you actually make them aware of the fact that, you know, your, your dog is very capable of emotional experiences, very similar to yours, maybe not quite as um, in depth as yours is, but your dog can feel sad. He can feel unhappy. He can feel ecstatically happy all those kinds of things and he's his emotions can fluctuate as much as yours can and that often helps to make people just feel a little bit more sympathetic and a lot more patient with their animals but conversely again you know when we're talking about the the effectiveness of implementing a behavior modification program 
like I said, if the human isn't capable of receiving information, processing information and applying information, you're not going to get anywhere. No. So Amira is a tool that then can also be used on the people um, to show them how emotions and mood influence both what they're feeling and what their animal is feeling. Uh, and then, of course, it's very useful as a tool to monitor ongoing progress and changes. So mirror is something that, you know, when you start applying it, you do mood state assessments on a weekly basis. Uh, you do it weekly, you do it monthly to monitor how things are changing. Because mood states in general are usually quite resistant to change. Yeah. And it takes a long time for them to shift from negative to positive. And so it's important that for the practitioner, while you're working with this animal, you, you can't just use the, the mood state assessment that you did six weeks ago because that may no longer be the case. It might no longer be applicable. So you're constantly using it as a, a progress monitoring tool as well. Yeah, which is basically the same idea as we use in medicine, where we use pain scores. It's not just, it's not good enough to simply to, to, to subjectively assess a dog's pain level um, at a particular moment. You've really got to chart it and encourage the owner to chart it when, 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 when the, you know, when, when an animal is on, um, a particular pain medication you have to monitor it all the time and that's also part of the responsibility of the owner so what you're doing is applying those kind of evidence-based medical procedures into the behavioral process itself which is brilliant it's um you know it it's a very nice flexible individually applicable model yeah with a boatload of science behind it yes. but um it is it is something that you know it can be as complicated as you want it to be but you can also really simplify it when you're explaining it to what I affectionately call normal people. Yeah. So you know, people that don't spend all their time in front of computers <laughs> doing this sort of thing. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, you know, it, it also, it really helps people to understand what their animals are going through. Yeah. I think the time for saying, you know, a dog who shows any kind of emotion or anyone who says that a dog is capable of showing emotion is being horrifically anthropomorphic that time is properly passed yeah long time long time and the more we can actually demonstrate this to regular people the better for every animal that we encounter yeah. okay so you talk about the science of this tell us a little bit about where that route is from i know you work quite closely with mike mendel at oxford uh, yes, his work was actually one of the uh, papers that kind of kickstarted all of it. Mm. Um, there has been oh, so much research, so much research, honestly. We've spent a lot of time reading up. And I mean, anybody who's, who's ever stumbled onto something that they find interesting can attest to this, that there's this rabbit hole oh, yes. that you, know, you read a paper and then you, you click on one of the links in the paper and then that takes you down another path and you keep doing that until four years later you can't really <laughs> remember what you started or what you were looking for <laughs> so yeah and um, mike mendel's work was was very very important um uh, panksepp's work obviously uh because that is something that really resonates with me both of mm -hmm. those both of those approaches uh i have got Oh my goodness, I think I've got about in the book there are I think about 14 pages of references of sources of work that we yeah. use. Um, so yeah, no, lots and lots and lots of research went into this to try and determine exactly, you know, where where is this all coming from? What supports this train of thought? What supports the application of Mira? And Mira, like I said, you know, it's a it's a holistic assessment tool that's based in science yeah <clears throat> and i think i think that the, the science credentials are very solid because they came out of the idea of trying to get away from arguing over whether animals had emotions whether animals had consciousness or non-human animals had had these attributes which are which are kind of very philosophical questions that we still don't have answers to um, and it was the the idea was to get away from those and 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 find some way to objectively quantify animal welfare particularly farm animal welfare and i think that's where mendel's credentials were and i think that's where he started looking at these these dimensions of of emotions in relation to moods yes and, and judgment biases 
they, they seems to be, well, at the moment, uh, if you put two, uh, well, any of the people working in animal emotion or yeah. emotion for that matter in a room, you're going to have about 15 different opinions about what's correct yes. and what's not. Yes. Um, the two most prominently discussed uh, theories at the moment seems to be the discrete model of emotion and then obviously the, the dimensional model of emotion among others um, but having spent a long time reading and researching about both of those and where they're applicable and where they're not and where they differ and where they're similar the thing that kind of um, works nicely in Mira's favor is that both of those together form Mira yeah. Both of those different different theories, the similarities are enough that, you know, as a model, it works together. Both yeah. of them can be incorporated into the yes. model to take all of that into consideration and give a more rounded um, approach. Yes, yes. And it was Mike Mendel who really brought uh, the work of Lisa Barrett and Pangsat together. Yes. Be because, yeah. it, you know, the, the, the two complete opposite poles. And I think Mira sits beautifully in the middle of that, from what I've seen of it. And uh, it, it encapsulates the idea that you, you, we do have these discrete emotional states as defined by Pangset. Discrete meaning they are anatomically identifiable across species within, within a brain. And of course, Lisa Barrett's, which is much more on the fly kind of emotions, which are just conjured up and much, you know, very, very much a part of, of, of learned um, feeling states. Um, that we conjure up on the fly as, as opposed to things that can be pinned down to particular anatomical locations. And of course, it must be both because that, that's, how the, that's how the anatomy of the brain and the networks are arranged. Yeah. Uh, somebody else's work that I, I enjoyed tremendously on this mm. subject was um, Elizabeth Harmon Jones. Yes. Uh, they did a paper on the importance of both dimensional and discrete models of emotion. Yeah. Uh, that was a very useful piece of information as well that that a lot of it went into the the kind of nitty-gritty of mirror yes okay so um we talk about mirror we've, we've covered the m we've covered the e we've covered the h what about the r tell us a little bit about the r well before we go into the r i want to just quickly touch on the h bit again okay I, this is hedonic. <laughs> this is the hedonic budget, yes. Uh, one of the big changes that we've made to the hedonic budget is, um, so the hedonic budget is divided into um, the, the different PANCSEP positive systems, so things that need to happen where you've got seeking system activation in place, system and care system activation. Uh, but then what we've changed or what I've changed in it now is we've included a, a an element specifically that takes individual variation into consideration. Mm. In the old hedonic budget, we looked at type specific behaviors, and then we looked at how much time did the animal engage in this behavior before behavior modification, and how much time did we want him to engage in it afterwards. Yeah. With the individual variation, what that does is it allows us to really um, tailor make the hedonic budget for this individual that we're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, if I am working with a border collie, let's say for argument's sake, you know, border collies need to spend quite a lot of time engaged in seeking system activation. Yes. But if you are looking at a 19 year old border collie with really bad arthritis, who's blind in both eyes, uh, that dog, you cannot compare what that dog needs to what a two year old dog needs. Mm. And so the hedonic budget now allows us to really look at what does this individual animal need? in comparison to what all of these animals of this type needs. And again, this is something that um, was born from the work that we did at the zoo with, um, for example, you'll hear me talk about the gorilla a lot because boy, did I learn a lot from him, uh, a lot. <laughs> um, this individual didn't live in a group like other gorillas. Uh, he wasn't particularly fond of other gorillas. And so for him, what you would expect all gorillas to want to do was not applicable to him. And so what the hedonic budget assessment now does is it allows us to go, okay, what do you want? I know this is what you're supposed to want, mm. 
But is this what you really want? And more importantly, is it what you need? Which is also great for when we're looking at the hedonic budget of, for example, dog aggressive dogs. There are dogs out there that just don't like other dogs and that's okay. And honestly, if you don't like other dogs and you don't want to interact with other dogs, is it fair then to make you interact with other dogs because the idea is, well, you should socialize with other dogs. So you're talking about consent here, which is a word which I think is really, really important in the work we do. Yes, absolutely. Consent is something that I think um, to me is very close to my heart when it comes to interacting with animals. And the one thing that I can say is that having worked with dogs and cats for a very long time and having always done so from a motivational perspective, and I've, you know, I've been fortunate enough that I came into this industry without having gone the, the, um, the old way first. And so when I started working with very large things with lots of teeth, um, much, much, much bigger than dogs that could and would eat you if you did something that annoyed them. Uh, the one thing that quickly became clear to me is how much we take advantage of dogs just because we can. It can be with the best intentions, mm. but we often put dogs into situations where they don't want to be, um, that much rather do something else but because we think that this is the thing that needs to happen in order to make for a happy dog we do stuff with them and the the one thing that comes to mind for me here is a dog that i was working with that the owner had heard that in order to have a happy dog you have to walk your dog because dogs need mental stimulation and so you have to do that and you have to walk your dog twice a day every day this dog didn't like going outside. He was perfectly happy in his home environment. And the more she forced him by putting on a lead and going, come on, let's go and taking his favorite treats and you know, coaxing him outside and taking him for a walk, uh, the less he enjoyed it. And it got to a point where he actually, he, the look on that dog's face, whenever the lead came out was like, oh, all right, let's just get it over with. But he didn't particularly enjoy going out for walks. And it turned out that he didn't particularly enjoy going for walks because um, he was in pain. Not a lot of pain, not so much so that he would be visibly limping or anything like that. But he had enough low level pain that I think if I had to, if I had to equate it to something, it would probably be like if you have a, a sharp pebble in your shoe, or if you have a dull toothache. Uh, you know, it's not enough for you to go, oh, let me go to the dentist or, you know, let me do something about it. But it's enough that it's nagging in the back of your mind and it starts to influence how you feel and it starts to affect your mood. And with this dog in particular, his consent for going for walking was never asked. It was just assumed that you will enjoy walking. So let's go walking, even though he didn't really want to. And when we stopped taking him for walks, but started giving home-based enrichment, this dog's entire demeanor changed. And we could actually work up to a point where the owner was taught how to ask him for consent. Like, do you want to go for a walk? And he could say yes or no. I'm using straightforward English. Yeah? I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of interpretation here, but um, giving animals control over what happens to them to a certain extent. Um, that choice is something that I think has a, has a huge impact on them. Just like with humans, you know, we all want to have a little bit of control over what happens to us. And I think that with dogs, we take advantage of them because we, we do things that, that we think are in their best interest. So we talk about a dog in pain like that, and of course, something like about 50% of dogs who are presented with behavior problems, the underlying cause is undiagnosed pain, particularly aggressive problems. And so what you're talking about is another demographic completely, which are dogs which are compliant. And yet in the owner's eyes, the problem is not the behavior problem of the dogs, it's a behavior problem of the owner. 
And so this, this is another thing, I think, where um, the idea of taking a step back and looking at mood state as opposed to what the dog is doing at the moment, which is emotional state, really helps you to start identifying um, the dogs that do have simply an underlying problem with mood um, and yet are not necessarily um, uh, showing any kind of particular behavior disorder, or at least it's picked up as something different um, when the owner calls you in. Yes, and you know, by looking at the animal's mood and constantly monitoring it, I must be honest, um, I actually think that, this is gonna sound very odd. I actually think that COVID has been very good for the profession. Uh, in the sense that it has opened all of our eyes to the possibility of using technology more in the consulting process. Um, to give you an example of what I mean, Zoom is my new favorite thing. And yeah. what's up for, for that matter? For the simple reason that for the first time, I can look at what's really happening with a cat when I'm not there to disturb how that cat's feeling by saying to the owner, you know what, put your laptop on the ground where your cat is spending all his time and just click the zoom button, switch on the video and carry on. And I can sit on this side of my screen and I can watch this animal and see what this animal is truly doing and how he responds to things. The insight that that brings into being able to do accurate mood state assessments and accurate emotionality assessments has really been incredible saying to the owner, you know, when he's doing this, grab your phone and take a quick WhatsApp video for me so that I can see mm. what he's doing while he's doing it, mm. has really made, um, it's made it so, so much easier. And because, while he's actually doing nothing. Yes, and while he's- doing because you're capturing in between nothing. those moments. Yes, and you know, I want to see all of it. And the thing also is, you know, with owners, well, for anybody who's who's ever done any kind of cat consultations, um, the majority of your clients, um, you know, you spend, I mean, I, I've spent so much time as a cat behaviorist lying on my stomach looking under somebody's bed, because that's usually where the cat is, you know, um, and, and you see some strange things under people's beds that, you know, I, I don't miss that at all. Uh, but being able to be uh, an impartial observer where my presence isn't influencing what the dog is doing or what the cat is doing mm. has really, really been an incredibly useful tool because the evaluation that you can do is just that much more accurate. Okay. So where does the reinforcement side of this fit in? Ha, huh. okay. That is a long answer. The short version is... Um, reinforcement you know when we look at it from a mirror perspective we want to look at why is this behavior happening and not just from an external perspective in other words what are the owners doing that could be causing the continuation of this or what is the animal getting out of it but we also look at um in detail about particularly what is reward what does this animal see as reward and how does this animal's emotions come into play? What is he getting out of it from an emotional benefit perspective? Because a lot of the times animals do things because it works for them, because it makes them feel better or because it makes them feel good. And, you know, in the, uh, in one of the chapters of the book, we talk a lot about exactly what is reward, what is the difference between wanting and liking? Um, how do you, how do you differentiate between the two? And how do, you, how do you kind of reconcile with what you think an animal wants with what the animal actually wants and what the animal would actually like? Because there is so much, I find there is so much confusion attached to the terminology in the industry. You know, people think when you say reward, you're talking about food and food is always a reward. Right up until the point where it's not. You know, and very often in training situations or behavior modification, you know, yeah, food works and food can be a great motivator, but what if that animal has reached a point where he's no longer hungry or he's feeling a little bit queasy because of all the cheese sausages that you've been feeding him, where now suddenly what he's getting is no longer what he's liking, and now it's starting to have a different impact on how he's feeling and his emotions at the end of the day or the things that then end up 
uh, influencing how he feels about the situation that he finds himself in. And so, you know, we talk a lot. It's a very long chapter that discusses all the differences between how do you evaluate what is reward? How do you evaluate liking versus wanting? And how do you use that in behavior modification and particularly in the application and the assessment process of mirror to evaluate why this particular behavior problem is happening? Because very often, you know, animals, like I said, behavior problems are usually there because there is a very large emotional component to them. If there wasn't an emotional component to it, the animal wouldn't be performing that behavior. He wouldn't be doing it. And it's very seldomly only because of I'm going to get attention from my human or I'm going to get something from someone. The majority of the time it's when I do this, it makes me feel better or it makes me feel calmer or it makes me feel X, Y, Z. Or how I'm feeling in this situation is guiding what to do next. And that is where the reinforcement assessment part of MIRA comes in, where we critically evaluate what is this animal getting out of performing this behavior, both from a neurophysiological perspective, as well as an emotional perspective. And okay. then obviously physiologically as well. All right, so moving back to our gorilla, and I'm just really interested in this idea of consent. Um, how do you work with an animal like that when you want the animal to be compliant for something like a blood sample which needs to be taken for a diagnostic test? The short answer is very carefully. Um, <laughs> the slightly longer answer is, uh, so patience is not my strong suit or it, it hasn't been, it wasn't my strong suit. Um, I have learned in my work with these animals, that it is a completely different approach. Even though the fundamentals are the same, the approach, the actual practical application varies tremendously from species to species. Uh, with this particular gorilla, his name was Makoko, mm -hmm. the most beautiful gorilla you've ever seen in your life. Um, majestic animal. And with him, just to give you an example of consent, when we started working with him, this was an animal who was born in captivity, raised in captivity, spent his whole life in captivity, who had never experienced a moment's frustration in his life because his meals were delivered at exactly the same time every day. Um, all his physical needs were being met. He was in excellent shape, all of those kinds of things. And he never had to deal with delayed gratification or inability to solve a puzzle or anything like that and so his life was very boring boring <laughs> uh, predictable his mm. life was very predictable when we started doing um, mirror analysis on him and changing his hedonic budget with the good intentions of we're going to provide you with you know more opportunity to engage in exploratory behavior or foraging behavior, which mimics closely what gorillas do in the wild. In the wild, they spend a large portion of their day great, uh, browsing. You know, we go here, we sit and we eat this handful of bamboo shoot, then we amble over there and we grab a bunch of those leaves and they're constantly moving and eating little by little. So that's, by little. That's, that's the wanting side of reward and reinforcement. It's actually causing him to want something rather than just supplying it all the time. You never want Absolutely. anything if you're giving it on a plate. Absolutely. And there was no, there was no wanting for him. He, he just got everything was just given to him all the time. Uh, one of my, my biggest battles was to try and convince the kitchen that he didn't need his favorite pumpkin diced into little bite-sized nuggets and that he was more than capable of actually smashing a pumpkin open and yeah. picking up the bits for himself. But anyway, so when we started introducing this, you have to now work for your food in the sense of here's a puzzle, solve the puzzle too, but easy puzzles. I'm, I'm not talking about complicated things. I'm talking about taking a bucket and putting it in the bucket and hanging the bucket from the tree and not even high. Um, he, he had this 
incredible experience where you know you're standing there and you're expecting him to go oh this is great i'm loving it i'm so enriched and so fulfilled and what he did was he got so angry with us that it was it was actually glorious to see i mean you think you've seen some somebody throwing a tantrum when you have kids um, it's nothing compared to a 35 year old gorilla having a full-blown temper tantrum because he's really cross because now he's not getting his favorite nibblies on a silver platter, literally. Um, and so with him, we found that in our attempts to enrich him, we were actually frustrating him so much, frustrating him, because he, he didn't want to work for anything. No. He, he just wanted his special little things all the time without putting any effort into it. And it took us a long time and, and moving back quite a lot and scaling down the difficulty of things that we presented him with and finding out what works for him and what doesn't work for him. What does he like in comparison to what does he want mm. and how to actually put those two things together. Um, that eventually it almost became a, a kind of a game. Once he, once he discovered how nice it was to actually behave like a gorilla and, and look for his food instead of just sitting at the feeding feeding um, platform and waiting for his food. Uh, he actually became cross with us when we didn't provide it, provide his food in the form of enrichment. And it became, um, it was very interesting to see how he would, um, <laughs> one of the things that come to mind in one of the examples is where we, we spent two weeks making him a 25 liter um, ice lolly where we would take um, a layer of fruit with water and we would freeze it and then once that's frozen you add the next layer with vegetables and you freeze it on top of that and eventually you have this giant great big ice lolly with all the different things in mm. it took four of us to carry this enormously heavy ice block into his enclosure we put it down, we thought, oh, this is gonna keep him busy all day long. Um, and out he came, looked at this thing, picked it up with one hand, looked me straight in the eye, I kid you not, threw it against a rock, and then looked at me as if to say, is that the best that you could do? And so of course we had to adjust what we were doing and we had to add um, fire hose to tie it to a pole to challenge him a little bit more. But what we found is that in the beginning, he didn't want to participate. He didn't want to be enriched. He didn't want to have anything changed. He liked his life being predictable and easy and all of that. And when we were starting to look at, okay, you don't want to work too hard. You don't want to try too hard. What are you willing to do? What can you do? And we started with little pockets of, um, Hessian bags filled with straw with, with essential oils on. He quite liked the smell of certain essential oils. And we found that if he came up and picked one of those bags, that was his way of saying, okay, today I'll work with you. And on those days, he would be a lot more receptive and a lot more responsive to anything that we wanted to do, including um, when we started doing target training with him to teach him, all right, fine, lift your hand up, put your hand here, hold on to the bar, um, put your hand through here so we can touch and work up to blood draws, for example. Um, once he had consented to participate and we understood what his, his signals of consent meant, he became a lot more uh, interactive with us and a lot more receptive to the whole process. And it was also, I think for me, it was a huge big learning curve for me because I kept on thinking, what can I do to make you more compliant? And of course, that's a little bit of a contradiction because if you make somebody do anything, it doesn't mean they're compliant. So it was a big learning curve for me about standing back and being hands off and going, you know what? If you choose not to participate, if you choose not to come up to the gate and engage, I have to respect that and I have to go, all right, not today. We'll do something else tomorrow. And an interesting um, 
side effect of that was that I found that as soon as I started doing that, the relationship between us changed significantly. Uh, and he, he actually chose to spend more time with me than me just being the person carrying the clicker and the bag of dates. Uh, and, and it became a far more uh, mutually um, beneficial relationship based on respect, where he could say, uh, in, in you know, his way, he could say, you know what, today we're just going to sit in the sun and you can sit with me. Um, he did a lot of, he heard a lot of Panksip. I read a lot of Panksip to him. I don't know if you understood anything, <laughs> but I read it anyway. <laughs> um, and, and that also got me thinking about how introducing consent and mutual cooperation and taking into consideration how saying, yes, I want to work with you can be applied to dog people or dog owners and cat owners. Exactly. We, we actually say to our dogs and cats, you know what? If you don't want to do this today, that's okay. We can still just hang out. We don't have to do this if you don't feel like this. And the relationship that the, the changes that that affects in a relationship is enormous mm. because suddenly all the pressure is taken off. And like I said to you um, at the beginning of all of this, we take advantage of dogs because we can, even if we do it with all the best intentions in the world. Well, no intentions at all. I think people do yeah, because that's, yeah. that's the way they think dogs are happy. Absolutely. And dogs are, you know, dogs are such such individuals and such easy creatures yes they are um you know they they really are just so easy uh, yeah there's still many i think all over the world live unfulfilled lives which i think is a trick that we behaviorists and people working with dogs miss because they're not misbehaving and it's yes. like your gorilla i think when you start looking at this is why i wanted you to talk about these large animals because it's only when you start dissecting the behavior of them, you start identifying where the pieces are missing in a dog's overall happiness. Absolutely. And, and just also, you know, for you, I mean, this is something that I would suggest every single person who works with dogs and cats do is go and spend some time training something bigger than you, mm. whether that's a horse or if you have access to an elephant or anything like that because it makes you a far more um, intuitive trainer because all the things that we take for granted, you know, when I say dogs are easy, I mean, dogs are, are generally, you know, they, they, they're not easy as in they don't have any problems. They just, it's easy for us to take advantage of them because we, you know, we know how to motivate them. We know how to get them to do stuff and, and dogs are just, they're wonderful. But well, they're, they're easy. They're, 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 they, they are very good gorillas in the sense that they are happy just to be content with liking, the likings yes. of life. Yes. But they need, they need to be challenged with the wantings, which I think is such an important point and something we kind of miss. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of the thing where once you take that happy and, and I don't want really, to, I'm struggling not to use the word complacent because it's not the word that I'm looking for. But once you take away the, okay, I'm going to do stuff with you because, you know, you're my human and I, I like spending time with mm. you. Once you take that away and it becomes, we'll work on the animal's terms today. It really does open your eyes to how consent from an animal needs to be given before we start working with them and then how to extend that same courtesy to the dogs and the cats who live in our homes because we we often don't purely because they'll do stuff because we're asking even if they don't particularly feel like it yeah, well of course, they know this, how to fit in they do yes of course this has been a, a very interesting eye-opener for me because uh, it's winter here at the moment and it's mm. quite cold and unpleasant and um, it creates a bit of a, a conundrum for me as a, as a general dog guardian where I have uh, a short-haired dachshund who doesn't like getting out of bed until 11 o'clock in the morning <laughs> in winters. And I, I'm faced daily with the conundrum of, okay, but you have to go outside because you need to go and relieve yourself and, and not actually just going, come on, let's just quickly take the blanket off and quickly take you outside so you can go and have a wee and then you can get back into bed. Because when I lift up the blanket and he looks at me, I can see he doesn't want to go out. Mm. He needs to, 
but he doesn't want to. And so that's where my behaviorist brain goes, well, he, he, you're now asking him to do something that he doesn't want to. And then I start having these internal conversations about, you know, <laughs> stress immunization and all those <laughs> kinds of things to try and justify the fact that I'm you know, taking advantage of my dog. <laughs> All right, so I think that you've given us a pretty good tour through the book. Um, it's gone off to Dogwise Publishing. Have they yes. given you any idea as to when it will appear? I know they don't want to do any edits with it or anything like this, which is just brilliant. Uh, they, they haven't. And I think that okay. that's probably a very sensible thing because right. from, what yeah. I, from what I understand now, the next steps are all the little fiddly bits like indexing and, and layout yes. and design yes. and yeah. all those images kinds of and all that kind of stuff. Yes. yes. So um, I did my best to deliver them a manuscript with pretty much almost all of that done. Yeah. So Good. hopefully sooner rather than later, but yeah. I will definitely, Brilliant. you know, as soon as I know. Fantastic. Well, well done for that. And Thank it sounds you. a really, really good book. I, you know, I'm really looking forward to reading it. I, you know what, I wrote it with the idea of I want people to understand this approach. Yes. Because the more people that can utilize this as a tool, the more lives we can change for yeah, the better. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so I hope that it's, um, I hope that that is what it does. And if there are two people who end up reading it that end up using this and changing 50 lives, then I'm a happy camper. Yeah, Hopefully. well, I think basically you've, you, you've, the, the book has come after you've actually applied the system. Yes. Which is a good way of doing it. And it's also, you know, I, I made a point of not just writing it from a, from a dog perspective. We discussed yeah. um, a horse case in there. There's a cat case in there. Um, dog, horse, cat wildlife yeah i think um, oh yes there's a there's a, a nguni bull oh, uh, right just you know for the sake of diversity in there as well <laughs> uh, to show that you can really apply this on everything uh, and it was very much written with the intention that this is something that can be used in captive wildlife facilities anyone who works with animals in any capacity yep. can use this assessment protocol to constantly monitor emotional and behavioral well-being in yeah. animals that they work with. Yeah, perfect. Karen, you've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for spending the time talking to me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've loved it. No, no, my, 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 my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, so love from us all here. Thanks again. And I will switch over and we will get this thing wrapped up. Perfect. Have a wonderful evening. Yeah, and you. You take care Thank now. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.